Welcome everyone, and thank you so much for joining the COVID-19 vaccine tell. We would now like to begin with a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that Hillsborough is located on the traditional lands of the Atfalati, also known as the Kalapuyas, who are now part of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde. They stewarded this land throughout the generations, and we take the opportunity to thank the original caretakers of this land. Today's town hall is brought to you by the Youth Advisory Council, a city of Hillsborough program that brings together 25 students from five different high schools around Hillsborough. YAC's mission is to serve and improve the Hillsborough community through positive activities, policy advice, appreciating diversity, and forming more supportive relationships between youth and adults. In the past year, we've each felt COVID-19's unprecedented impact on our lives. Sadly, so many people in our community have been seriously affected and are currently struggling. Thankfully, new vaccines have been developed and approved to fight the virus and are starting to offer hope for ending the pandemic. Tonight, you'll get facts and answers from the vaccine experts. Spanish interpretation is available for this town hall. At the bottom of the screen, you could see a globe icon with the word interpretation. Please click the globe to choose Spanish if you would like to listen in Spanish. Traducción en español está disponible en este evento. En su pantalla, en la parte de abajo, encontrará un icono de un mundo con la palabra interpretación. Por favor, presione el botón y escoja en español. If you have any questions, feel free to type them into the Q&A box at any point during the town hall. Our panelists will try to answer as many questions as possible. If you can, please indicate the name of the panelists you wish to direct your question to. And without further ado, I would like to welcome Mayor Steve Calloway to start us off tonight. Thank you so much for joining us, Mayor Calloway. You are so welcome. And thank you to Aaron. Uh, thank you to the entire Youth Advisory Council. A special thank you to Rania because you have all done such an amazing job of planning and preparing and publicizing. And at a time when uh, people need factual information, scientific information, accurate information, and answers to questions, this webinar is more important than ever. And I will also share personally why this why the vaccinations are so important. Um, I am out of town right now visiting my dad and it is the first time in over, well, since December of 2019 that I have been able to hug him because we are both fully vaccinated and I'm so grateful for the vaccination which allows us to uh, connect you know, in a, in a physical sense beyond just the emotional and the intellectual. So um, thank you, you know, for from the bottom of my heart uh, for sharing this information and providing this forum for such distinguished guests so that we can all um, just be back to that point of familiarity again, where we can connect intellectually, emotionally, socially, and physically. So thanks for all of your work. And thanks again for everybody who's participating and everybody who is attending and learning uh, during this webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mayor Cowboy, for those inspirational words and outstanding support. We are excited to have over 35 attendees with us tonight. Joining us now is Ms. Tina Elon, Governor K. Brown Special Advisor for COVID-19 Vaccines. Ms. Eland specializes in government, government and administration, program integration, health system transformation, and Medicaid policy, as well as serving in, on several boards. Welcome, Tina. Our first question is about vaccination timelines. Can you explain how the state established the timelines for COVID-19 vaccine eligibility and what other factors affected our decisions on who was eligible when? Absolutely, thank you for um, having me here tonight. This is a real pleasure for me and honor. Um, first of all, I think it's really, it's important for all of us to remember. I think it's hard to remember from today when we see demand softening for vaccine, but 
but it was a very scarce resource when it was first introduced. Very um, few vaccines uh, were available in the state so and nationally. So the decisions needed to be made very hard, um, difficult, ethical, um, medical ethical um, decisions needed to be made about who could be first in line to get, who would be prioritized for a vaccine, to get vaccine. So we looked first to the Centers for Disease Control, the federal agency that has a, a, um, an advisory committee on immunization practices. And what they did was establish a timeline and order of priority for populations looking at the science and looking, and looking at ethics. Uh, they prioritized initially healthcare workers to be first for obvious reasons. They were most exposed to the disease um, in the healthcare setting and long-term care residents, people, older people in long-term care are living together, they're eating together, uh, they're in usually fragile health. So they were prioritized in that first group as well. However, having said that, now the states had some flexibility in what they could do. And if you remember, if everyone remembers, the governor made the decision that it was so important to get school back in session, to get kids back in, in classrooms, that she moved um, school teachers and staff ahead of um, the population that's 65 and over, which is the population that um, the federal government had put um, after, after long-term care residents and healthcare workers. It was a controversial decision, but I think it was the right decision. It, it um, allowed us to get back to a hybrid model and get kids back in classrooms um, sooner than um, we may have done otherwise. Um, after that, with the groups that were prioritized by the, by the CDC, by the Centers for Disease Control, were essential workers, um, uh, people with high risk or underlying medical conditions, people conditions that would make them more susceptible to more um, serious forms of the disease and older, older adults. What the governor did here was establish a vaccine advisory committee because she wanted any decisions about the priorities in Oregon to be based in equity. And so she put that, that group together and asked them, okay, we, we, have, we know healthcare workers are first and we know um, educators will come next, but what should be the priority after that? And short of putting the, um, uh, uh, well, I guess I would say it this way, what that group decided or recommended was that people with underlying health conditions, it becomes a proxy for race and ethnicity because then in that group, uh, uh, that group is also very overrepresented with, um, for, with people of color for historical reasons. Um, so they, they prioritized people with underlying health conditions and frontline workers, the same thing, they're overrepresented um, by uh, people of color. Um, I think probably it, if you've done the, the, the research in the state, you'll see that, that, that for instance, the Latinx population makes up 13% of the population in the state and 24% of the incidence of COVID-19, um, hospitalized at a much higher rate. It's part of the reason that the governor wanted to prioritize equity and form the vaccine advisory committee for that reason. Um, so, that's, so that's how our phases were, were set up was with that in mind, um, moving migrant and um, seasonal farm workers um, uh, pretty early in the process, seafood and agricultural workers, anybody who has to work can't distance themselves and um, uh, have to work in close proximity to each other. Um, everyone became eligible on April 19th. And um, since then, 16 and 17 year olds were approved on April 19th by, by the um, CDC for receiving vaccines. And then this week, 12 to 15 year olds were approved. So um, now there's a lot of vaccine available and um, everybody is eligible down to the age of 12. Thank you. Um, here's, a, here's a question on the minds of many. Is there a goal date for when everyone in Oregon would be vaccinated or at least when we can reach herd immunity? So, um, 
there's a this I think it was this week in COVID time we uh, I lose track of time a little bit um, this week the governor made her announcement that she wanted the state to be at 70 percent of of adults in the state having received at least one shot um, the reason she chose that metric is and she wants that date to be by the end of June um, the goal here is to get the state opened again to, so that we can all get back to our, our lives, at least something like pre-COVID days. Um, and getting to that, that level does not give you herd immunity, but it certainly is a point at which people can move around more freely and we can think about um, uh, uh, protective um, measures like masks differently. Um, as you see that today, the or yesterday, this the Centers for Disease Control also changed their guidance on masks because there's um, a clear feeling that enough people are getting vaccinated that we can um, we don't need um, the same level of of safety measures that we had before. So by the end by the end of June, we're looking for 70% of adults to have at least one shot. And we have the governor has made a commitment to the Latinx community that she would like to see 80% of adults in that community with at least one shot by the end of August. That work is to, to make sure that um, the vaccine is delivered in community and in um, culturally and linguistically appropriate settings is is harder work it's more you have to be more intentional um and uh that's why she's she um put that timeline in consultation with community members out at the end of august and um and actually increase the bar so that the level we need to reach all right thank you one question to ask for a person who has yet to be vaccinated can Oregonians choose which vaccine they can receive? So that you can, you probably can't receive a vaccine. Uh, you probably can't choose what kind of vaccine you want to receive at any individual site. They typically offer one vaccine at a site. Um, having said that, I would I would preface my remarks by saying, you know, my advice always is the best vaccine is the, the next one that's available to you, the one that's closest to your arm. The, we have three highly effective vaccines available. Um, and that's um, my, you know, my recommendation is that you take what's what's most closely available to you. Having said that, people have preferences and people have a right to ask questions and have a right to have preferences. So we have asked and guidance is that any vaccine site actually post what vaccine they are offering so that you as an individual and as a consumer can look at that and can say, you know, that that site is offering Pfizer and I would really rather have Moderna. Um, or that site is offering Moderna and I'd really rather have J&J &J because it's one shot and, uh, and I'll be done after one shot. Uh, people have a lot of different reasons for their preferences. So my advice is look at what the site is offering and make your choices on that base, um, basis rather than looking for um, multiple vaccines at a single shot, at a single site. All right, thank you so much, Ms. Tina. We will now welcome Dr. Dana Hergunani, Oregon Health Authority's Chief Medical Officer. Dr. Hergunani is an experienced pediatrician and public health professional who is passionate and is about designing and implementing innovative strategies for improving health outcomes and reducing health disparities. In her position, Dr. Hergunani uses her medical experience to help inform healthcare policy and strategy for Oregon Health Authority. Welcome, Dr. Herganani. I'd first like to ask, what is the current number of Oregonians who are vaccinated, and what is your assessment of where we are at? Thank you, Leslie, and um, thank you for having me tonight. It is also an honor for me, and um, it's a thrill to be here this evening with you all. Uh, so first, I'll talk about a couple different data points about uh, that helps us understand how we're doing with vaccination in Oregon. So first, um, according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, as of today, 
Just over 61% of the eligible adult population in Oregon has received at least one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. In other words, 2,033,360 people in Oregon have received at least one dose of vaccine. We passed the 2 million mark this week and we have definitely been celebrating. Um, a couple other ways to think about it, well over 70% of people older than 70 are vaccinated in Oregon. And we are currently averaging about 32,000 doses administered per day. I'd say that we are certainly making good progress um, when we look at other states and compared to the nation, but I'd also call out that we have a lot of work to do, particularly to address the disparities in vaccine rates by race and ethnicity in Oregon, and particularly for communities who face the greatest health inequities and are disproportionately impacted by COVID-19, as Tina described earlier in her remarks. Um, for example, the rates of vaccination among American Indian, Alaska Native, Black, Hispanic, and Latinx communities is far lower than the vaccination rates for white Oregonians. We are making progress to reduce these disparities, but it is slow and not fast enough, and we know we have more work to do. And this is the intentional work uh, in front of us. Um, also already mentioned, we've been working with leaders in the Latina, Latino, Latinx community to set that target of getting uh, up to 80% of that population vaccinated by the end of the summer. And we are working with other communities across the state to also reduce gaps in vaccination for their community. So we still have work to do. We're making progress. You can monitor uh, all of this on our website daily if you're interested. Um, you can look at our vaccination rates by age, sex, race, ethnicity, by county, um, and we're continuing to watch how we're both closing those gaps and reaching that 70% target that Governor Brown has identified for all of us by the end of June. Uh, I'd like to ask, what is OHA's role in distributing vaccines, and how is OHA ensuring equitable access to vaccine appointments? Great, thanks for that question, Leslie. So I'll describe a variety of roles that um, the Oregon Health Authority has in the distribution of vaccine. Um, there's a whole number of different roles we play. So let me walk through some of them just to give you an example. So first, anyone who wants to provide COVID-19 uh, vaccinations or vaccinate people uh, need to start by enrolling with Oregon Health Authority as a COVID-19 vaccine provider. So we do that work. We are recruiting people constantly to step up to be vaccine providers. And we've been working in our state to expand who can be eligible as a vaccinator, such as traditional health workers and students in health professions and beyond. So that upfront role is a pretty significant one that we've played and is, is all new since this COVID-19 pandemic and since these vaccines have become available. OHA is also in charge of allocating doses to enrolled vaccine providers across the state. So this means that we tell the federal government who they should ship vaccine to in Oregon, one of those enrolled providers, how many doses and which type of vaccine. Um, this is based on what the federal government tells us our state's allocation is. And we're working with vaccine providers to understand what number of doses, can they receive? How quick can they get them in arms? How, do, how many do they need week over week? And we're paying attention to that, certainly regionally and geographically to make sure we're getting doses everywhere across the state. Um, the doses of vaccine are starting to change quite a bit. Um, our our um, access points for vaccine are going to be changing as some of, some of our mass vaccination sites start to ramp down. So we have more work to distribute doses farther and farther and in smaller doses across many providers. And so that's all a work we're doing underway to get the vaccine distributed. A couple other things, OHA is also directly participating in vaccine efforts. For example, we have a mobile vaccine team that is providing vaccinations in all parts of the state. Right now, we're really currently focused on uh, getting vaccinations out there for agricultural and food processing workers including migrant and seasonal farm workers, among others. 
So we have teams out there on site um, and teams who are actually giving those vaccinations. We're also currently working hard to set up what we call vaccine hubs across the state. Um, vaccine hubs are important for a variety of reasons, particularly for the Pfizer vaccine, which is what is eligible for children and youth down to 12. So when Pfizer is delivered, it comes in a large number of quantities of vaccine, over 1,100 doses per shipment. And it also requires very specific ultra cold storage if it's not going to be used within two weeks. So we're contracting with health systems and other partners to receive the shipments of Pfizer, repackage them, and ship them and distribute them out to smaller sites like community clinics, uh, community vaccine sites, and beyond. And then finally, in our distribution role, another example that I give is really expanding our partnerships with community-based organizations and other partner vaccine providers like local public health authorities, FQHCs, and health systems to make sure we're planning and implementing vaccine efforts that are really culturally specific and linguistically accessible to a variety of Oregonians who are still seeking out vaccine at this time and are really looking for that trusted source of vaccine access. So that's certainly not all of the work we're doing, but that's a variety of the efforts. Um, and many of those are focused on ensuring an equitable distribution and ensuring vaccine gets to people who have been most disproportionately impacted by COVID. Thank you. Moving forward, um, we heard a lot of frustration early on about the challenge of getting a vaccine appointment. Uh, last week, PDX Airport began drive up vaccinations without an appointment. Is this still a challenge to address now that everyone 16 and over is eligible? Great question and an, and an area of really important focus for all of us. Um, definitely, we see that things are becoming easier for um, both the age eligibility now that this week 12 and older and, and everyone 12 and older are eligible um, and our vaccine supply is adequate to meet the demand. Um, so this certainly makes things easier for us. Um, as a result of that, we have seen many vaccine sites move to walk in or drive up as you just uh, um, described. We know that some of the online scheduling tools have definitely been a barrier for people, whether that be through the technology challenges or access that they've created. And so we know that as more pharmacies, as more mass sites or community sites move to, on, uh, to walk up, this is gonna be reducing a barrier that we know has been problematic and we've been focused on. Some other things that we know we can do and, and have been working on to reduce barriers further um, are a couple things. We know that there were sites requesting early on social security numbers, insurance or ID, and we've made it really clear that these things are not allowed, they're prohibited um, as requirements for scheduling a vaccine or receiving a vaccine. We've also made it clear that individuals can't be charged a fee directly uh, for vaccine administration. If they do have insurance, um, the insurance can be charged, but no one can be paying out of pocket money to get a vaccine, they are free. Um, and we've also produced a lot of different guidance to try to reduce barriers. For example, we've produced clear guidance and repeatedly pushed this out um, about the obligations that vaccine providers have to meet federal language requirements and also to comply with the American with, uh, with Disabilities Act regulations. Uh, so I think we are moving into a better place um, where some of these barriers are becoming lessened, but we again still know we have work to do to ensure trusted sites um, that are really accessible to all of our communities who are looking for vaccine. My final question is what is herd immunity and when can Oregon reach this stage? Thanks for the question, Leslie. I think Tina did a phenomenal job of answering a similar, a similar question. I think we still have yet to know exactly what it will take, what percent of Oregonians will need to be vaccinated where no longer COVID spreads. But we do know that we uh, have that in sight where we know we can start um, having safer communities. Um, the 70% target that Governor Brown uh, has put forward in by the end of June is definitely in sight, we can reach that. Um, we need everybody to participate, to spread the word about the importance of vaccines. And we know that things will be safer at that time and we can start getting back to a more a normal lifestyle. But herd immunity will take longer than that. We will still have 
work to do to get more vaccinations in arms, uh, to make sure we're reducing or eliminating those disparities or gaps. And we know we're still gonna need to get children vaccinated. Uh, right now, uh, only you know, youth 12 and up are eligible. Um, we think as early as this fall, we might have a vaccine um, authorized for emergency use, a use down to younger children. And then that will be critical again to reduce the spread. So 70% is in sight and we need everybody to help us. Um, and we're gonna still have work ahead to do. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Hergunani. I would now like to introduce Dr. Adam Kellis, Oregon Health and Sciences University healthcare provider. Dr. Kellis specializes in caring for multi-generational multi families. He also has a focus in sports medicine and men's health. He enjoys working with families from the local community and getting to know its diverse residents. Welcome, Dr. Kellis. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you very much for having me. Um, it's very exciting to come and sort of dig into what are these vaccines um, and why are we getting them? <laughs> yes. All right. So our first question is a little bit of a loaded one. And so what are the differences between each of the available vaccines? And is there a vaccine that's better than one? And then part two, with that, would you mind shedding some light on the recent decisions to stop using the Johnson & Johnson vaccines and then to resume the use of the vaccine? Sure. Uh, I'm going to break it down first with uh, what vaccines do we have available to us? So there are currently three vaccines that are approved for use in the United States. They are commonly known as the Pfizer vaccine, the Moderna vaccine, and the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Those first two vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna, are what are called mRNA vaccines. Um, and that means that they contain mRNA, which is a code that tells your cells how to build a protein. Um, and that protein is a spike protein for the COVID-19 virus. Um, and so after having that mRNA injected into your arm, your cells express that protein, and then you build an immunity to COVID-19. The other um, vaccine, which is the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, is uh, what is called a viral vector vaccine. That vaccine was made using um, an adenovirus, which is a virus that typically causes sort of common cold type symptoms. Um, this virus though was modified so that it cannot reproduce in your body. So it can't cause an ongoing infection. But what it does is it presents, again, that same sort of spike protein that's on the virus so that your body sees that protein and then develops an immunity to it um, and you know, then you are immune to COVID-19, which is great. Um, the question of is any of those vaccines better than any others? I think the answer is uh, no, they are all great vaccines. Um, they have all shown great efficacy, um, particularly for preventing hospitalizations or severe illness um, and poor outcomes. When we think back to when these uh, vaccines were first being tested and then released um, for use, we remember that the uh, efficacy for the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines was very high, right? It was in the 90, 90 percentage, um, which means that very few people in that test group actually had symptomatic disease. When this, these were actually tested against our original viral strains. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine actually came out a little bit later than those first two vaccines. And it was tested in um, a population that contained some of the um, more aggressive variants. Uh, and so it had a little bit lower efficacy when it first was released, uh, about 66% of prevention of symptomatic disease. But importantly, all three vaccines have very, very high prevention of hospitalization and severe illness. And I think it's really important to keep that in mind. All of these vaccines will keep you safe. Um, and th they have all been shown to also prevent spread of disease. So another great reason to get these vaccines. Now, after the Johnson Johnson vaccine was released, um, we do something where we follow outcomes, right? So we do this with any medication or vaccine that is released to the public. They continue to um, survey people who've gotten it 
and they're looking for do people develop any sort of uh, symptoms or other conditions that might be different than the general population. During that, um, during the surveying, they did notice that there were some cases of blood clots with the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. And um, these were very few cases. I believe initially it was one in 7 million vaccines that it was a case of a blood clot. Yeah, very, very few. Yeah. But we, this is a good thing. The CDC and the FDA said, you know what? We want to investigate this a little bit further. And so we're going to pause the vaccine for now. We're going to go look at all these cases, ask if there's any other cases out there, because you know sometimes there may be cases that haven't been reported yet. And, uh, and then come back and give new guidance. And so they did that. And we all remember there was a pause. And after the pause, uh, they produced a report that said there was approximately seven cases per 1 million. So still very, very few cases showing that the Johnson Johnson vaccine is very, very safe. Now, one thing to note about these cases, they were all in women of reproductive age. So all these cases were in um, women between the ages of 18 and 50. And so the guidance that came out of that is if you are a primary care physician like myself and you're talking to patients about vaccines or you're someone who's actually giving the vaccine, um, you should have a conversation with these patients and say, hey, there's this very, very, very small risk, but you should be aware. And so if you develop any of these particular signs or symptoms, you will reach out to a medical provider. Um, so that's sort of the story with the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. Now, um, all three vaccines have been shown to be very, very safe and very, very effective. And so I think that is really the take home. And I agree with Tina that, you know, if you have an opportunity to get any of the vaccines, whichever one is the most convenient is the one you should get. At the same time, if you are a little bit worried, um, particularly if you're in this you know, particular age group, um, then it's okay to say, you know, I would prefer to get you know, the Pfizer one or the Moderna because we want you to get the vaccine and it's not important to us which one you get. It's just important that you get vaccinated and you protect your community. All right, thank you. And so I know that you touched on symptoms a few times. A few times. So, if a person hasn't gotten vaccinated yet, what symptoms should they expect after getting the vaccine? And are there any possible long-term side effects? Those are both very good questions. Um, so there is some guidance around this. So all three vaccines have very similar symptom profiles after vaccination, and so we do counsel patients. Um, in particular, where, the, where you get the vaccine, that site on your arm, you may have some pain, um, you may have some swelling, you may have some redness, and that is normal, um, but it should resolve in just a couple of days. That being said, some people may have more symptoms than that. They may have more what we call systemic or body symptoms, and so they may have fatigue and feel very tired, they may get some headaches, some body aches or muscle pain in other regions of their body. Um, some people do get chills and even low-grade fevers um, with some nausea. Those are all, I would say, more typical symptoms. And so as long as they're mild and they are resolving in the first few days, then that's okay. Um, if you are concerned, certainly reach out to your medical provider. Um, some advice, stay well hydrated. That can help with your symptoms um, in particular. And, and take um, some, you know, pain medicine if you need to, such as, you know, ibuprofen or Tylenol, um, if that's safe for you. Um, yeah, this is a great yeah. tip that people should remember. <laughs> and that's all, uh, that's all normal. And if you're getting the Johnson and Johnson vaccine and you are someone who's uh, a woman between these ages, I think there are some extra things to look out for. Those symptoms tend to come actually a little later. So, uh, in the cases that we saw, it was between five and 15 days after vaccination. Um, and those are more like intense headache, abdominal, severe abdominal pain, um, severe back pain, vomiting, vision changes, uh, shortness of breath, 
significant leg pain, swelling, and or bleeding. And so if you have any of those more extreme symptoms, especially after the first few days, you should reach out to a medical provider and be seen urgently. Um, but again, I will emphasize, you know, that is a very, very rare occurrence. All right, we have time for one more question. Uh, what are the benefits of getting a vaccine and how do we know if the vaccines will be effective? Uh, both are very good questions. The way I think of benefits is sort of three prongs. So I think of personal benefits, I think of social benefits, and I think of societal benefits. So on a personal side, um, when you get the vaccine, you are keeping yourself safe. Um, you are helping prevent yourself from getting ill. Um, some people may have conditions that put them at increased risk for hospitalization. And so they're greatly reducing that risk. Um, and you also get some um, mindfulness. You get the opportunity to go out in the community and feel more comfortable just not worried about getting sick from other people and or getting other people sick. And so I think that's also a great personal benefit. For a social benefit, you, if you are vaccinated and you are around other people who are vaccinated, you don't have to wear a mask anymore, you can hang out, you can socialize, you can have small parties. Um, I think that's great. We're going to see, you know, other, other events show up probably this summer and you'll get to go enjoy those as well. So I think there's a huge social benefit of actually finally getting to see other people. I'm excited, as the mayor said, like to go see my family and go see my friends that I haven't seen in a whole year, which I think many other people are as well. And then a societal benefit, which I think uh, Dr. Harganani and Tina have um, uh, talked about, which is, you know, we'll be able to open up and freely move around and get towards that herd immunity where people who are unfortunately immunocompromised or have cancer and the vaccines may not be effective in them, they can feel more comfortable going out in society. And so you're not just helping yourself and your loved ones, but you're also helping these other members of community be able to re-engage in community and enjoy the activities they wanna to enjoy too. So you're doing a great societal benefit as well by uh, getting the vaccine. Um, how do we know it'll be effective? Uh, so this is a hard one, I'll be honest. Uh, we do know that it is effective, which I think is fantastic and is, is something that we should celebrate. Um, I talked a lot about that with that first question. Um, and then going forward, um, you know, there are some signs that people who have been vaccinated can get infected. Um, I'll point out the New York Yankees have an outbreak right now and many of them were vaccinated. And so I don't wanna ignore that. Um, we will continue to uh, track who's getting infected how sick are they getting? Because right now, even if they are getting infected, they're not getting very sick. They're not ending up going to the hospital. So it is still a very good vaccine for that. And so I would still encourage people to get it, even if they thought, oh, I might still get sick. You have that secondary benefit of not going to the hospital. Um, and then if we see that for whatever reason, we have new variants or um, you know it mutates here, then we will continue to decide, do we need a booster? I know a lot of people have heard about that. Um, or will we slow opening up a little bit until we kind of calm it down, get a little bit more people vaccinated? Um, so those are things we'll continue to, to monitor going forward. Um, but right now I will say it is very effective um, and I think it will continue to all right, great. Thank you so much, Dr. Kellis. I know I learned a lot. I hope our audience learned a lot as well. So thank you. Yeah, and we are now excited to hear from our Washington County Commissioner, Nafisa Fai. Commissioner Fai is a small business owner and a public health expert with experience in advocating for and passing policies that increase health outcomes. She serves on several committees and boards and cares, cares greatly about diversity and inclusion. Thank you so much for being with us today, Ms. Commissioner Fai. Thank you so much for having me and I'm excited to be here and uh, to dialogue with you all. Yeah, thank you. So um, similar to what we asked Ms. Tina earlier, what is Washington County's role in vaccine distribution and how is Washington County ensuring equitable distribution of the vaccine to vulnerable populations? Um, great question. 
I think, uh, you know, uh, if you've asked me this question in the past, um, it would have been really hard to uh, answer and because I think there was a lot of unknown um, and the supply and the demand ratio was pretty imbalanced and um, and there's a lot of um, discrete sites that were providing uh, vaccinations. Uh, but currently in the present time, you know, I think uh, Washington County uh, beefed up their role as the, uh, the local health authority in providing vaccinations and uh, partnering both uh, private and the public sector and really uh, creating a lot of uh, robust sites that provide um, vaccinations to our communities and, and really embarking on campaigns to uh, disseminate some of that communications. And one of the things I'm really um, excited um, uh, that we're doing and we've done is partnering with uh, local community-based organizations and specifically culturally specific organizations uh, to really engage to say, how do we deliver uh, um, um, you know, vaccines to the communities that we're serving. Uh, so really as a local health authority, uh, Washington County was um, to create as many, um, um, to create opportunities to vaccinate as many uh, residents as possible in Washington County. And um, so that's been, and in the past, you know, in the future, I assume uh, vaccines uh, and it'll just be one of the sort of like the flu vac uh, vaccine that everyone gets and it'll be accessible everywhere. Uh, yeah, and uh, can you tell us what access is available to these specific populations of community members, people with disabilities, people experiencing homelessness and undocumented individuals? Yes, absolutely. Um, this is another thing that uh, I'm so glad that uh, we're having this conversation now and this question particularly now than in the past. And I'm really glad the um, previous panels really touched on, you know, where we've been and how we got here and what that journey was like and how uh, some communities have been disproportionately impacted negatively. Uh, it's but, uh, both the COVID and the vaccine deployment and uh, and, you know, uh, the role that historical uh, systemic racism has played and, and hopefully use this as an opportunity, le you know, uh, learning a lesson, uh, to learn some lessons from this impact and, and this experience and to have it as a uh, sort of a game plan in future uh, disasters. Uh, in terms of specific to what's accessible to folks who are experiencing houselessness, uh, Washington County has partnered a lot of different organizations um, that provide vaccinations, um, more specifically Project Homeless, uh, Connect, uh, Family Promise, uh, Just Compassion, Home Plate Youth Services, Community Action, you know, uh, and so many, so much more. I can list them off and, or I can send it the list to uh, Rania to share it with the group uh, and City of Beaverton. Uh, winter shelters, um, day center, you know, um, there's a lot of um, uh, sites and, and opportunities to um, uh, help uh, folks who are experiencing houselessness to get vaccinated and a lot of different partners. Uh, Good Neighbor Center is another partner that uh, Washington County is partnering to provide uh, vaccinations. And I think in terms of people who are experiencing or people with disabilities, um, there are a lot of uh, Washington County specific partners that people can reach out to, to uh, schedule and get vaccinated. Uh, Washington County Developmental Disabilities Program, uh, Washington County Disability Aging and Veteran Services Program also provides, uh, also Oregon Health Authority Adult Foster Home Licensing is another program. Uh, that's also providing um, assistance, um, Meals on Wheels, uh, and um, uh, there's also Medicaid in-home services providers. Um, for um, so there's a lot of um, um, a lot of different access and um, uh, and sites that are providing the you know the specific vaccinations to specific uh, communities. Uh, 
and and in terms of undocumented there's a you know i think a, i don't know um, i think we touched on this um you know if anybody wants to get vaccination uh, you know nobody's being asked uh, for documentations or any of that uh, virginia garcia and a lot of uh, uh, um, organizations are uh, helping disseminate some of that conversation uh, communication and and engage the community to ease if somebody is feeling a uh, little unease about getting vaccinations because of uh, documentation uh, challenge. Um, there's a lot of different organizations that are helping people navigate that. Yeah, that's that's awesome that we have that. And uh, let's finish on something that many people might want to know about. Uh, what is being done to build back trust and dispel the fear that BIPOC communities have surrounding the vaccines and the medical system in general? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, I, I don't know how we're um, going to build back trust uh, this uh, quick, um, but it's going to take a long time and, and we're, you know, intentional to push Washington County to partner with uh, community-based organizations, you know, culturally specific and linguistically specific to engage and to have, uh, you know, that courageous conversation around, you know, the fears and the mistrust and, uh, and address them, you know, some of their concerns and acknowledge some of their concerns because this isn't a fear that's based on myth. Uh, this is a fear that's based on real life experiences that people have experienced and, and you know, uh, and we're, we're not post, um, you know, post racism. Um, so I think uh, it's gonna take a long time, but in terms of Washington County, you know, they're, they're in, embarking on community, um, education campaigns to uh, dispel some vaccine myths um, and encourage people to get vaccinated. Uh, I've learned that there's a Facebook campaign uh, um, around um, in Spanish and in English uh, specifically dedicated to this uh, piece. And then also uh, repeating again, um, the community-based organizations uh, and partnering with them um, to, um, you know, to engage in a more meaningful and, and where people at, at in terms of their fears and trust. And, and also, you know, um, getting testimonies from people who look like me, you know, and um, so I think those are some of the, uh, uh, you know, projects and, and things that we're doing in Washington County. and. Um, but it's going to take a long time to really um, build trust. Uh, but I'm confident that uh, with our community now really seeing the value of uh, the vaccine and how it'll help us get to that new normal, uh, I think people are really uh, putting that fear aside and saying, okay, maybe this time is different and I'm gonna uh, get vaccinated. And then, uh, you know, when people actually get the vaccines and uh, they don't uh, get sick or all the fears that they've heard, uh, then, you know, it encourages others to also go get vaccinated. So I encourage all, anyone who's watching this that get vaccinated, share your experiences, you know, uh, and the positive experiences that you had and what you've experienced when you got your vaccine and encourage your friends and family and neighbors to also get vaccinated because the more all of us get vaccinated, the quicker we can start this new normal. Yes, that's uh, very true. So thank you so much, Commissioner Fai, for sharing this information with us. Absolutely. At this time, we would like to share some vaccine resources. All organ, sorry. All Oregonians aged 12 and older, older are, are now eligible to get vaccinated against COVID-19. As you can see on the screen, these are different ways to sign up for the vaccine. These resources will also be available on our website, along with the English and Spanish videos for this town hall. 
would like to reiterate that COVID-19 vaccines, Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson are safe and effective. They are the key to achieving community immunity from COVID-19 and returning to normal life as soon as possible. The COVID-19 vaccine will be free at no cost to you. You do not need health insurance. Proof of eligibility or identification is not required. Different vaccines require different doses. If you receive either a Pfizer or Moderna vaccine, you will need to get two doses. If you receive a Johnson & Johnson vaccine, you will only need to get one dose. Full immunity from vaccination will not take place until 14 days after the final dose of whichever vaccine you've received. Great, now we have time for questions. So our first question is from, it's from Ms. Sue. Uh, the question asks, uh, oh, and this is gonna be um, especially asked towards to uh, Donna, Miss Donna Hurugani. Um, so the question is, why push this injection when survival rates are zero, okay, for, zero year olds and 12, through 19 are 99.997%. This is not an FDA approved and you will not know the long-term effects of this brand new gene technology. Okay, sorry. Would you like me to repeat the question? I'm sorry. No, that's okay. I'm happy to jump in uh, to start and welcome uh, others to join me in that response as well. Um, I am um, really excited for the new eligibility done at age 12. Um, over the last uh, several months, we've been seeing the rate of infection increase in children. And we know that COVID-19 has both short-term and long-term impacts at children. And we also know that there are a source, a significant source of spread in the community. Uh, so they also put other people at risk who maybe can't get access to a vaccine um, due to uh, immunocompromised state or can't respond. So they're both an important, uh, important role for both children and also for the community, um, as we've talked about earlier. Um, the, the studies that have been done in children similar to adults did not skip any steps. Um, they've been uh, shown to be highly effective and safe uh, in the Pfizer vaccine, which is the one that has been approved uh, at this point through emergency use authorization. Um, you know, immunizations are a critical part of all ch childhood approaches to preventive disease. And this is yet just another one to ensure that our kids can safely get back to their day-to-day -day activities, to their school activities. Uh, and to both reduce the risk to themselves um, and to others. I have two kids myself in the 12 to 15 year old age range and super excited that they're gonna get their first, their first vaccine dose uh, this weekend. I'm happy to also uh, take a shot at that question. One thing I wanna sort of point out too is, I think there's a feeling out there that these vaccines were developed in a very, very short period of time, right? Eight to 12 months. And, and the truth is the technology that went into these vaccines has been under research for up to three decades um, and, and been studied thoroughly. So the vaccines, like she said, have, did not skip any steps and they, they have done years and years of research before implementation. Um, and so the safety is there, even though it does feel like it came very rapidly. So that's just my uh, two cents. Thank you. All right, I'd like to ask this question to Dr. Kellis and later on expand it to the rest of our panelists. What would you say to people who refuse to get vaccinated because they fear it affects on their health as well as affect on children? Uh, thank you. I think that's a, a, an excellent question. It's actually something that comes up daily in my practice. Um, I've also had the same conversation with my family and my friends, and I'm sure the other panelists have as well. Um, there is a lot of um, vaccine hesitancy. Um, I spoke to a little bit about the part where people are hesitant because it's so new. 
Um, the way I start these conversations is really from a standing of empathy and understanding. I think you have to listen to either the patient or your family member and really understand where they're coming from. Um, uh, the commissioner also addressed some, some concerns people have just from historical things that have happened to certain populations, which make them a little bit more hesitant. And so I think once you've sort of listened and understand where they're coming from and you're able to address their specific concerns, uh, then you can, you can present the facts. You can talk to them um, regarding their own personal risk as well as emphasize, as we, we've done many times, protecting their friends, family, and community. Um, but what I found is it's not, it's not people are afraid of microchips. Um, it's not some of the, the more um, odd concerns. It's very logical concerns that come from a, a space of, of thinking and, and safety. Uh, and oftentimes there are pieces that people haven't heard yet. And so they need to hear that before they're ready to get vaccinated. And I think it's totally fine for people to ask questions. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, I have a question for Tina. Someone uh, who is attending tonight writes, when do you foresee work and school to get back to normal? So I, uh, we're hoping that by the fall, there'll be enough people vaccinated in the state that we can go back to um, normal school. We're not outlining that at this point because we don't, we're not there yet, right? So until we, until we get to that point, um, uh, but, that's, but that's our hope is that next year in school looks very, very different. Um, our primary concern is that people are are safe and feel safe. And so that's what we would be looking for. Work, I think I've heard from employers that they feel like work is going to be changed from here on out, that there will be more working from home than we have ever seen before because they're finding that that you can um, that people can work from home and be very productive. In fact, um, sometimes more productive. But um, I think that I think the way we work will look very very different going forward. Just as we've seen in you know we've seen in healthcare, we've seen the growth of telehealth. Um, I don't see that going backwards either. So I think there's some there have been some. Um, good developments out of this, some technology and some things that have changed that I don't think we'll, we'll walk back from. Thank you. And uh, one more question before we move on to the resources. Um, this just comes from anonymous attendees, but uh, for Dr. Kellis and for Dr. Harganani, um, how long does the vaccine immunity take? Does that length uh, of time change based on the COVID uh, vaccine variant? And um, is someone that would ideally have already their first dose be safe to meet with friends and family without a mask or social distancing if they are fully vaccinated? Sure. So multiple parts, and I'll try to get to all of them. Um, as far as when are people fully vaccinated after receiving the vaccine, uh, for all three vaccines, it's two weeks after your last dose. Um, and there's actually a really good study that came out, um, I think end of April, looking at 65 and older who received the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine and uh, prevention of hospitalization. And they saw that about 94% um, increase in prevention of hospitalization in that group uh, two weeks after the second dose. Um, they also looked at people who'd only received one dose and they had a 64% reduction in hospitalization. So you can see that there was a significant benefit in waiting that full two weeks after the second dose. Um, so that's, I think, where we stand. We also saw the same thing with Johnson & Johnson and Johnson & Johnson was uh, tested against the variants. So I think it stands for all three that that, that two week is, is the right mark. Um, the second part of the question, remind me real quick. Is it safe to go back to what would be like more normal um, social? Yes. I mean, I would say yes. After two weeks, uh, you were fully vaccinated. Um, 
Uh, there is great guidance out from um, OHA as well as the CDC regarding this. Um, but yes, uh, and, and the new guidance is that if you're fully vaccinated, you can go out in public as well, um, in both indoor and outdoor without a mask. But absolutely seeing friends and family, that's, that's a great benefit you get for being vaccinated. All right, and this is all the time we have for our town hall, but we do acknowledge that we still have some questions that haven't been answered. We will do our best to get them answered and we'll upload the answers along with resources on our page, hillsborough-oregon.gov slash yak. Thank you again to Mayor Calloway and to all our esteemed panelists, Dr. Kellis, Ms. Tina Edland, Dr. Hergunani, and Commissioner Fai for their invaluable knowledge and expertise with us. Thank you as well to our audience who came today. And we hope you will encourage friends, family, and neighbors to get vaccinated. By working together, we can help our community recover and thrive again. Thank you for watching and have a wonderful rest of your evening.